Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order on Monday, September 16th at 7 or 2 p.m. And certainly want to welcome all of you there here with us this evening. Uh, if we could just take a moment of silent meditation, and I would request if you could to remember those that were victims in the shooting at the Navy Yard in Washington, D.C. this evening. Thank you. I ask Councilman Brown if he would lead us in the pledge. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, can we call a roll, please? Yes. Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Councilmember Brown. Here. Councilmember Katati. Councilmember Moffitt. Here. And Councilmember Shule. Good evening. We have uh, several proclamations that we would like to issue and read this evening. Uh, the first. It's a reference to Employ Older Workers Week proclamation. Uh, as Ms. Carol Diggs, the Senior Employment Coordinator for Durham Center for Senior Life, and she's present. Do you mind joining us? I was listening to him. 90.7 WNCU FM today in San Diego. We're having a party down at the Senior Center. That's, that's good. Uh, Where's the skilled and experienced workforce of over 52,000 older workers in Durham, Chapel Hill, North Carolina contribute to a strong, diverse workforce? Whereas the city of Durham respects the contributions, knowledge, experience, and skills of older workers, whereas 41% of older Americans aged 55 and older will make up 21% of the U.S. labor force by 2014. Where the city of Durham encourages employers to tap into the talent and resources of our growing population and workforce. Now, therefore, I, William B. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim September 22nd through September 28th, 2013, as Employ Older Workers Week in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to take special note of this observance. And with my hand, the corporate seal of the City of Durham, North Carolina, this is the 16th day of September 2013. Would like to present this to you for any comments that you might have. On behalf of the Durham Center for Senior Life, we would just like to say thank you so much, the city of Durham, and our wonderful mayor. We thank you very much. And we also have one of our older workers here today who has been nominated for the award, Ms. Barbara Allgood. Thank you. Serious, it sounds like you were really having a good time at the center of the day. Good things going on in Durham. Uh, the next is to recognize Disability Employment Awareness Month proclamation. And that's Rhonda Parker and Sarah Hogan, the Recreation Manager and Director of Parks and Rec, if they would join me. The proclamation speaks to the fact that the month of October has been designated by the United States Congress as National Disability Employment Awareness Month, whereas Americans with Disability Act of 1990 and the Washington Law Against Discrimination promote independence, empowerment, and quality of life, whereas workplaces welcoming of the talents of all people, including people with disabilities, are a critical part of our efforts to build an inclusive community and strong economy, and whereas we consistently work to break down barriers and work together to ensure that people with disabilities can participate fully in the work workplace and all aspects of community life, whereas we must continue to work for a community where all individuals are respected for who they are, celebrated for their abilities, and encouraged to realize their full potential 
and achieve their dreams, and whereas Durham Parks and Recreation and nearly a dozen community partners will host Unity in the Community Day on Saturday, October 7, 2013, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Holton Career and Resource Center in celebration of National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Now, therefore, I, William E. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim October 2013 as Disability Employment Awareness Month in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to take special note of this observance by joining together and reaffirming our determination to achieve a society that affords independence, justice, and dignity for all. And witness my hand, the Corporate Seal of the City of Durham, North Carolina, this is the 16th day of September 2013. I'd like to present this to Rhonda and Thank you, Mayor Bell, Mayor Pro Temp, City Council, City Manager, City Attorney, and colleagues and residents of the City of Durham. We appreciate this recognition tonight, and I'd like to introduce you to Sarah Hogan, the Manager over Special Programs and Mature Adult Programs, and also we have Marge Clemens, who is the Chair of the Mayor's Committee on for Persons with Disabilities. Thank you. Again, my name is Sarah Hogan. I'm a recreation manager with the City of Durham Parks and Recreation Department. It's certainly a pleasure to be with you this evening. Um, proud to work in a city that embraces diversity and welcomes all, values all as part of the fabric of the community. It's my pleasure to share briefly some things that Parks and Recreation is working on. As always, we're working with our General Services Department to ensure that all of our facilities are accessible. And one of the things we've done in the last year is try to identify that we have one of each type of facility, a ballpark, a dog park, fishing pier, boating area, that we have at least one of those within the city and are working to increase those as we have funding and resources to do so. Also working um, to ensure that our staff and our public are aware of the accessibility within our department and our programming and uh, sharing information with others as we get an opportunity working with our marketing department, our public affairs staff to increase the message that all persons are welcome, especially those persons who have different disabilities. Just a few pieces of information I wanted to share while I had the opportunity. Um, this summer, the summer of 2013, our camps have included 86 youth and teens who had disabilities in our traditional summer camp programming. In addition to serving approximately 59 youth in specialized recreation opportunities. So we've certainly expanded our opportunities with youth and continue to also work on expanding those opportunities for adults. This year we're offering adapted programming, which in many cases will lead to traditional opportunities for folks who have dif different disabilities. Um, those include adapted aquatics, moving into traditional swim programs, adapted fishing opportunities that will lead to other community opportunities for folks who enjoy fishing. Our survey, as we evaluate programming, um, at the end of each program, we survey our citizens to find out what they liked and how things work. And one of the questions we added this year is if you have a special need which requires an accommodation, was an accommodation provided? And so we've asked that question to you know hundreds of folks. 13% of our respondents said yes, that you provided well for my needs. 2% said no. I was a little disappointed. 1% said somewhat, but I needed more help or other help than you provided. And of course, 85% of our citizens said that they didn't need any accommodation, therefore it wasn't really relative. But as we continue to do things, we try to measure what we're doing and try to make improvements along the way. We're also looking at our partnerships and resources and trying to ensure that the city is doing the best we can with what we have available. And recently, City Council accepted a couple of grants to help us do that. There was a $4,000 grant given by the North Carolina Parks and Recreation Association through the Arthritis Foundation to allow us to do some walking programs with folks who have arthritis. And then about a $3,000 grant that was given by the Carolina Panthers to help with the Carolina Panthers uh, flag football program. So we continue to look for ways to serve our citizens um, beyond our city resources. And then the last thing, is, as uh, the mayor and Rhonda both mentioned, we have Unity in the Community, which is a celebration coming up on October the 5th at the Holton Career and Resource Center. I've put some information at the back if you have interest in attending that event. It is free. It's from 11 until 2 at the Holton Career and Resource Center. There'll be entertainment, a kids area, 
um, food, makeovers, um, exhibitors, just lots of things. Again, all are welcome. Please come if you have a chance. October the 5th from 11 to 2 at the Holton Career Resource Center. Again, thank you all. Good evening. I'm Marge Clemens. I'm the chair for the Mayor's Committee for First Disability. Giving respect to our mayor, um, Bill Bell, and our city council, and our citizens of Durham, I am so welcome to be here and so pleased to be among you. Um, what we are doing at this time, we are going to celebrate October the 24th, our, um, dis our disability, which is national campaign. And what it is going to be is that uh, the Marriage Committee for Persons with Disability is sponsoring a poster composition. Children and youth age five through 21 are invited to create posters that create the theme because we are equal to the task. This is coming at Natural Disability Employment Awareness Month Awards. Um, this year, um, the theme echoes the message of the National Office of Disability Employment Policies ongoing campaign for disability employment. It promotes ideas about what youth with disability can do when they receive encouragement for their employment dreams. Each poster should inspire people of all ages, especially employers, to understand that people with disability have the cap capability to be successful in the workplace. We try so hard to do what we need to do, or resources from our office, to encamp, to encourage, <coughs> to endure the strength of toward awareness in our, in our um, successively of goals that we feel among our citizens. I thank you so much for the committee that I have and for our city council, for our mayor that just stands and gives us a great support and the energy to continue on. We have several so, so good individuals that really care on our committee. Our law enforcement, our directors that, and that are in our committee of staff of the city. Um, our director, Ron Park, Parker, Rhonda, which is really, really wonderful. Our Sarah Hogan, which is outstanding, a manager of supporting us. They just do a great, outstanding job. And I just want to say thank you very, very much, and God bless each one of you. Well, that's Jalala Donaldson, the Home Human Relations Manager, and from Neighborhood Improvement Services. Would you join me, please? I think it's very appropriate we have this proclamation uh, this evening, especially considering the uh, turnout that we had at Immaculata yesterday, Sunday. Uh, this is recognizes Hispanic Heritage Month. It speaks to the fact of whereas America's cultural diversity has helped strengthen and define our country for hundreds of years, whereas National Hispanic Her Heritage Month is celebrated from September the 15th to October the 15th, is a time of celebration and appreciation of the rich culture, tradition, and numerous contributions made in our communities. Whereas the theme for Hispanic Heritage Month 2013 is Hispanics serving and leading our nation with pride and honor. Whereas we recognize the positive impact that our Hispanic communities have on the social, cultural, and economic development of North Carolina and the United States. Whereas the city of Durham takes pride, great pride, in the contribution of the Mayor's Hispanic Latino Committee, and also to the many successful community collaborations with El Centro Hispano, where Hispanic Americans continue to excel in many areas, such as public service, business, education, and government. This perseverance has allowed for continued success and accomplishments through education and hard work, 
therefore en enriching our communities, and whereas many Hispanic Americans today are thriving, others are still struggling to overcome obstacles including language and cultural barriers, as well as discrimination, whereas September the 15th was chosen to start the celebration due to the anniversary of independence for five Latin American countries, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Additionally, Mexico declared its independence September 16th and Chile on September 18th. Now, therefore, I, William B. Bell Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, who have I proclaimed September 15th through October 15th, 2013, as Hispanic Heritage Month in Durham, and here I urge our citizens to take special notice of this observance and witness my hand in the the of the City of Durham. This is the 16th day of September 2013, and I present this to Delilah and others that may have comments. Thank you, Mayor Bell. The Human Relations Division of NIS is pleased and honored to serve as staff liaison for the Mayor's Hispanic and Latino Committee, and we are also pleased and honored to work with El Centro as the Fair Housing Education and Outreach Partner. We've done that for many, many years. And um, with the Mayor's Hispanic and Latino Committee, we are committed to building bridges between city government and Hispanic Latino residents of Durham. We know that discrimination, as well as language and cultural barriers, limit the economic and social opportunities available to Durham's Hispanic Latino population. This committee seeks to improve opportunities and open doors for Hispanic Latino residents, and we work directly with partners who are committed to providing education and outreach to the Hispanic community. So at this time, I would like to call up our chair of the Mayor's Hispanic Latino Committee and have her uh, make a few remarks. And after that, our Fair Housing Education and Outreach Partner, President, CEO, Pilar Rocha Goldberg. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having us. Um, I would like to share with you a few words, and it's a pleasure for us to be here today. The Hispanic Latino community continues having a profound and positive influence on the United States through its strong commitment to family, faith, hard work, cultural identity, economic power, and service. They have enhanced and shaped our national character with centuries-old traditions that reflect the multi-ethnic and multicultural customs of their communities. I am honored to be part of a city that celebrates the contributions of its Hispanic Latino community, and I take advantage of this moment to recognize the richness that diversity brings to the city of Durham and its people. On behalf of the Mayor's Hispanic Latino Inclusion Committee, I thank you all for tonight and for continue working hard to continue having a, an amazing society, one day at a time, one person at a time. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, on behalf of uh, the Board of Directors and the staff of El Centro Hispano, and also on behalf of the community we represent, I would like to thank the Human Relations Department, the LILA, the, Hispanic, the Mayor's Hispanic Committee, the City Council, the Mayor, uh, for making Durham a city, as a welcoming city for Latino immigrants. We, as El Centro Hispano, we will continue working in integrating the Latino community to the community at large. Thank you very much for this proclamation. As Councilwoman Katari, if she would. Thank you, Mayor. I wanted to invite uh, members of the Diver Employee Diversity Council and our sister cities to come up and while I read this proclamation and also um, Deputy Manager Keith Chadwell. Okay. This proclamation is for Equality Week in the city of Durham. And it reads, whereas the city of Durham is known for the rich diversity of its citizen population. Oh, wait. Sorry. 
Hey, Mavis. How are you doing, Katie? Okay. Sorry, I should have waited till you got here. <laughs> And whereas this, our city has placed a priority on being both truthful about the differences that sometimes threaten to divide us and been vigorous in reaching out to bridge those differences with compassion, and whereas our city has attracted remarkable people to live here because of our commitment not just to tolerance and equality, but to true inclusion, and the city has prospered and been resilient both socially and economically in tough times, in part due to this diversity. And whereas this honest commitment to equality under law for all people has been a source of strength for us as a city, but we recognize that our work to fully realize this commitment is not yet done. And whereas both within and outside of our city, in our state, and in our nation, the great debate continues on whether our Constitution's foundational commitment of equality under law is truly a covenant to be kept with all of our citizens. And whereas we encourage our sister city sister cities, particularly Kostrama, Russia, to visit Durham and see the social, economic, and quality of life benefits for all of our community, which result from supporting diversity. We welcome them to take part in our continuing dialogue about the true meaning of equality, and we urge them to take all necessary measures to implement both legal equality and social inclusion in their own communities, including freedom of expression. And whereas the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington occurred on August 28, 2013, and the echoes of Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream ad address still reverberate within us, and whereas the city of Durham is proud to host the North Carolina Pride Parade and Festival September 28, 2013, with people from all of our state walking down Durham's Main Street to both celebrate the progress of lesbian, gay, and transgender people toward full equality and call attention to the rem many remaining areas of law in which the LGBT community's dreams of full equality under law remain unfulfilled. And whereas many members of the city council and the mayor intend to march in the pride parade, and whereas Durham's annual Latino festival will also take place September 28, 2013, sharing the vibrant traditions and folklore of our Latino and Hispanic neighbors with all of Durham, now, therefore, the City Council of the City of Durham hereby recognizes the key role that diversity and inclusion has played in creating our prosperity and unique sense of place, and declares the week of September 23 to 29, 2013, to be City of Durham Diversity Week. The mayor shall deliver a copy of this proclamation to Durham's sister cities and the mayor of Kostroma, Russia. Uh, this will be signed the 16th day of September 2013. And any comments from the uh, Diversity Council or the Sister Cities? Thank you very much, uh, Council Member Katati, and, and welcome to our friends from our Sister Cities, Mr. Mayor and members of Council. We thank you so very, very much for this acknowledgement. And in, so, and in my acknowledgement, would like to give a hearty citation to the men and women that serve in our Diversity Council, a very group of caring, uh, effective serving individuals who work very hard and uncompromisingly to make us whole. I would also like to acknowledge the work of the Neighborhood Improvement Services Office, its Division of Human Relations, in supporting this effort. Please know that in receipt of this, we'll be unyielding in our efforts to continue to make our workplace uh, very effective, make diversity a critical element in what we do, and effective public servants. Thank you very much. I'm Brady Searles, representing Sister Cities of Durham. Councilman Katati, thank you very much, Mayor Bell, and all members of the City Council. On behalf of Sister Cities of Durham and Sister Cities International, we express our appreciation for your support in Sister Cities, and we're certainly proud of the City of Durham for making this proclamation and this statement. The country of Russia has made a very strong statement with regard to their laws and policies, which would discriminate against gays. We in Sister Cities are very much opposed to that, but we're also very much supportive of maintaining our ties and our open communication with our sister cities around the world. We have six, but particularly for Kostroma, Russia. A number of people and citizens of the city of Durham have visited Kostroma and have stayed in homes there. A number of people who are citizens of Durham here have hosted some of those people from Kostroma, Russia, including some of the people standing here before you. 
they have developed those personal ties and a key to sister cities is that person-to-person -person communication so we can keep the lines of communication open and help them as they, we hope, move towards more and more support of equality and diversity. We support this very much and we thank you very much for your support and we look forward to our continued work with our sister cities, particularly Kostoma, Russia. Thank you again. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Um, thank you, City Council, Honorable Distinguished City Council people, as well as uh, City Manager and City Attorney <laughs> and everyone in the audience. This is a wonderful day. You know, we're sitting over here thinking about how wonderful Durham is and talking about diversity. The four ceremonial items were talking about the distinguishing of Durham being sensitive to older people, uh, disability, Hispanic, and, it's, and especially equality. So when you start thinking about this city, it's rich in this tapestry. I think about the quote from Maya Angelou that we should all understand that diversity makes for a rich tapestry, and we all understand that all the threads of the tapestry are equal in value, no matter what the color. So thank you all for representing the proclamations today. I think it means so much. Y'all should give city council a hand for this work. <laughs> for those who didn't clap, I know you wanted to. I'm not talking about you, Lewis. Um, <laughs> the Triangle Business Journal, um, hosted its inaugural leadership in diversity last week at the Golden Belt in the Cotton Room for the whole triangle. Um, and we were blessed um, to have uh, Mayor Bill Bell there. As a member of the diversity committee, I represent the, the Triangle Business Journal today to present an award to Mayor Bill Bell for being such a role model in diversity. Mayor Bell was the first and only elected official selected for this prestigious award. When asked what makes for a successful leader when it comes to diversity, Mayor Bell responded, I try to practice what I preach in an attempt to lead by example by advocating and promoting diversity in the workforce at all levels of government and in contracting. But one of the things that we talked about that I think is so important that we see is in Mayor Bell's leadership is that he understands that the art of thinking independently and together is important, as Malcolm Forbes said. So I'd like to present you the Bell with this award for a leader in diversity. First of all, let me, let me thank Farad and uh, certainly the council and uh, Triangle Business Journal and the committee that uh, chose to honor me along with other awardees for, the, for this, this, this award. I can tell you, I didn't ask for this tonight. Uh, the award was last week. Uh, uh, th those of you who may not know, uh, Farad is a former city council person, but he called and said he wanted to present it, so I said, okay, you can present it. So that's, that's why I'm here tonight. But Seriously, I, I think it represents uh, not so much honoring me, but I, I think you honor all the people who've worked with me that I worked alongside of to allow the city to do the things that it's done and continues to do, and to really make Durham a place where I say great things happen all the time. Uh, not only this, but all of the things that go along. So I, I appreciate it. Uh, I, I honor it very much. But as I said, it, it's really when you honor me, you honor the people who've worked alongside me and pushed me along. I appreciate it. Thank you. Let me recognize uh, any council persons that may have comments. Recognize Councilwoman Katani. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we have uh, Scout Troop 405 here from St. Matthew's Catholic uh, Church in Durham, and I wanted to recognize them and their leaders who are here. Uh, most of the scouts are compete. 
excuse me, completing their communication merit badge, and two younger scouts are beginning their citizenship in the nation badge. The scout leaders with them tonight are West Council, James Cunningham and Kevin Lilly, and I hope uh, they would rise and we can give them a round of applause. Thank you. Hi. Any other comments by members of the councils? Recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. I would just like to congratulate you again on your award. In addition, I would like to thank the volunteers who solicited for baby diapers last weekend. They solicited for and collected uh, baby diapers for needy families uh, at Northgate uh, Shopping Center. So there are lots of volunteers, and let me just make you aware of the fact that there are lots of families who need baby diapers. So seek them out. Um, and go and buy a bushel of them mm -hmm. and, and distribute them among our citizens. Thank you so much. I want to thank the Mayor Pro Tem because uh, she came up with, a, I don't know if it's a bushel full, but it's a carload of diapers that uh, she contributed to, the, to that event. Uh, I've been asked to, uh, May I add, I, I'm sorry. Just to add to that Council quickly, Brown. and that is, um, I want to thank the Mayor Pro Tem for mentioning that and um, because I did go down, we did, and, and donate. But uh, you, know, you think about where we are as a, a society, and it doesn't speak too well of us, the fact that we have to do this. But uh, believe it or not, uh, baby diapers can cost as much as $100 a month. And it's, it's sad and rather revealing that some people have to choose between putting food on the table or buying baby diapers. So I think this is a, a terrific organization that has formed and I hope all of you would, would step up and, and help uh, to donate uh, diapers to this, for this very needy cause. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Welcome. Uh, I've been asked to uh, make an announcement relative to the 2013 Bull City Stand Down. Uh, it will be held Friday, September the 20th from 8.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Durham County Memorial Stadium and the National Guard Armory. That's on 750 Stadium Drive. Uh, there will be a free dental clinic. Uh, they will be providing food, clothing, basic medical and legal assistance, housing benefits, educational benefits, haircuts, substance abuse and mental health assistance, job counseling, VA benefits assistance, local health and human services, personal care and supplies, flu shots, mammograms, showers, entertainment and drawings. And there's going to be free dat data bus access services for veterans to and from the event until 5 p.m. Again, this is recognizing our veterans. Uh, we call it a stand down, and certainly the public is certainly welcome. And certainly, we would hope all male and female veterans would uh, come out also. Uh, having said that, I'm going to recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I had hoped someone would make the announcement about Project Homeless Connect on October 3rd, which is very similar to the event that you uh, just described. I don't see anyone here from community development, but the event is October 3rd, and I believe it's still at the same uh, Durham Bulls ballpark. Is that the Armory this time? At the Durham Armory, and it starts at 10? Okay, thank you. Thank you. I tell people over and over and over again, uh, with all the challenges we have in this community, Durham is a very caring and giving community, and I think events such as this uh, just exemplify that. I would ask if there are priority items by the city manager. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Bell. Good evening, council members. I have no priority items this evening. Likewise, city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. Likewise, city clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. Uh, in that case, we will proceed with the agenda as printed. Uh, priority items may be approved with a single vote if a item is pulled from the consent agenda uh, either by a council person or 
member of the public, we'll discuss that later in the agenda, and I'll just read each consent agenda item. Item one is designation of voting delegates. North Carolina League of Municipalities Annual Conference, October 13th, 15th, 2013, in Hickory, North Carolina. Uh, item, and uh, Mayor Pro Tem is going to be the voted delegate for that. Uh, on item two is bid report, July 2013. Item three is proclamation of Equality Week in the city of Durham. Item four is funding for permanent housing for persons with special needs. Item five is grant project ordinance amendments for community development block grant, CDBG home program grant, and emergency solutions grant ESG for fiscal year 2013-2014 amended award amounts. Item six is grant project ordinance amendments for community development block grant, CDBG and home program grant for FY 2012-2013 actual program income received. Item seven is FY 2014 contract between the City of Durham and Center for Documentary Studies. Item eight is City of Durham Employment and Training 2012-2014 grant project ordinance superseding grant project ordinance number 14489. Item nine is contract amendment with General Management Solutions, Inc. to provide Workforce Investment Act adult and dislocated worker services and on-the-job training services from October 1st, 2013 through March 31st, 2014. Item 10 is a contract with the North Carolina Institute of Minority, for Minority Economic Development of Durham, North Carolina, to provide project man management services for the Telecommunications and Energy Jobs Training Pilot Demonstration Grant. Item 11 is the second amendment to assignment agreement between the City of Durham and the Durham Bulls Baseball Club for the operation of the Durham Athletic Park. Item 12 is a resolution authorizing the city auction. Item 13 is extension of lease between the City of Durham and the Durham Arts Council. Item 14 is development agreement for the construction of a wrapper building adjacent to the Durham Performance Arts Center. Item 15 is amendment number one to the contract for renting stationary containers. Item 16 is Munis Software Annual Support and License Agreement. Item 17 is amend ordinance for fixed sewer only rates. Item 20 can be found on the general business agenda. Item 21 is the Durham County Board of Health recommendation on municipal water fluoridation. Item 22 is an item that can be found on the general business agenda at public hearings. I entertain a motion for the approval of the consent agenda item as read. Recognize Councilwoman oh, I, I Pro Tem. Mr. Brown had asked for some additional information on, on item 8, and I probably did too. So you want me to pull this item? Yeah, could we hold it if that information is not? City of Durham Employment and Training in 2014. Let us, let us just hold that item up and I move the rest of the consent agenda. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes six to zero. Thank you. We move to the general business agenda. Item 20 is 2013 second quarter crime summary report. Who's, who's presenting that? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I have a correction. It's number nine instead of number eight. We need to change the. We will make her the motion, second withdraw the motion, and so we can restate the motion yes. for the approval of consent agenda item. Yes. The, the, the item that should have been pulled was item nine and not item eight. Indicate. Because, yeah, we needed more information. Mr. Mayor, so I duly note that, okay? All right. Okay. Sure. Chief Lopez. Mr. Mayor, council members, city manager, city attorney, tonight I want to discuss the Durham Police Department's 2013 second quarter highlights and crime information. This report covers the department's six performance measures, violent crime, Property crime, part one index crimes, clearance rates, response times and priority one calls, and staffing levels. The executive summary also includes additional information about significant accomplishments and highlights during the second quarter. Okay. I'm pleased to tell you that 
reported part one crime was at a 15 year low during the first six months of 2013. This was in part due to a significant decrease in aggravated assaults and burglaries. This chart shows January through June part one violent crime numbers over a three year period. Although violent crime was up in three out of four categories, our violent crime is down overall by 9%. There were 13 homicides reported during the first six months of this year compared to 11 during the same time in 2012. Arrests have been made in four cases. One was a murder-suicide and two have been ruled self-defense. Six are currently open cases. One case involved domestic violence and three cold homicide cases were also cleared. The FBI expanded its definition of forcible rape for UCR reporting purposes. The category of forcible rape starting on January 2013 now includes offenses that would not have been included in prior years that will affect our numbers. There were 13 rapes reported during the first six months of 2013 that would not have counted in the 2012 part one crime rape statistics. There was a significant decrease in the amount of uh, aggravated assaults during the first six months of this year. The total number of victims decreased by 19%, while the number of actual incidents was down by 12%. The, during the first six months of 2013, reported crime was at the lowest since 2005. Overall, part one violent crime dropped 9% during the first six months compared to the same time in 2012. Part one property crime and larcenies are also at a 15 year lows during the first six months of 2013. Property crime was down 5% from the same period in 2012. Burglaries and larcenies were down while motor vehicle thefts increased from 2012. Motor vehicle thefts were up during the first six months we have had numerous thefts involving Hondas and have made several arrests in these cases. We also have noticed a recent uh, significant increase in the thefts of scooters, which has been a regional problem. We have notified the community of this issue and urged people to make sure that they know the serial number for their scooters and mopeds. We've also focused on metal thefts, which do affect our larceny and burglary numbers. There were several thefts of industrial air conditioners coils during the second quarter and our patrol officers and investigators conducted operations to prevent further thefts. Our burglary numbers dropped by 10% during the first six months of 2013. We believe that our residential awareness program, RAP, has contributed to the decrease. RAP was started in the fall of 2011 and combines crime analysis, crime prevention, and high visibility patrols to target resident burglaries. Officers also made several burglary and larceny arrests after people called 911 to report suspicious activity. The FBI clearance rates are for cities the size of Durham with a population of 100,000 to 250,000. The 2011 FBI statistics are the most current ones available. The Durham Police Department's clearance rates for part one crimes were above the average clearance rates in all part one crime categories for our cities our size with the exception of homicides during that time. Our homicide clearance rate today is 66.67%, which puts our homicide clearance rate now above the FBI average for cities our size. There were 6,178 priority one calls for service from July 1st, 2012 through June 30th, 2013. We keep these records by fiscal year rather than calendar year. Our target average response time is 5.8 minutes. We were close to that goal with an actual 5.9 minute average time. Our goal is to respond to at least 57% of our priority one calls in under five minutes. We did not meet that goal in that we responded to 54.4% of priority calls in under five minutes. We've continued to increase our standard in recent years and our targets are stretch goals. Our sworn staffing level was at 99% at the end of the second quarter. 
We started a basic law enforcement training academy in August, and, are and we are currently fully staffed. There are 12 Durham police recruits in our current academy. Our non-sworn staffing level was at 90, 89% at the end of the second quarter and remains at that level today. We're in the process of filling several of these positions. Durham police employees participated in numerous community activities during the second quarter. Employees ran and biked in the torch run on May 30th to raise money for North Carolina Special Olympics. The police department has raised about $40,000 for this charity since 2008. Officers from the Community Resources Unit participated in the American Tobacco Kickoff event in April. During the second quarter, officers conducted 307 directed patrols on the American Tobacco Trail. In other community events, the police department's baseball team battled the fire department's baseball team to a tie as part of a community day celebration at Hillside High School on June 22nd. On May 6th, officers and members of the community attended the Peace Officers and Memorial Service to honor fallen officers. And employees participated in numerous other community events during the second quarter. Many of these activities are included in your executive summary. Durham celebrated National Night Out on August 6th, and even though that wasn't in the second quarter, I wanted to share some photos from this very successful event that involved more than 100 communities throughout Durham. I'd like to give you some good news about our Kalia on-site assessment in June. The Durham Police Department has been accredited by CALEA since 1991. This year, our department went for the CALEA Gold Standard, which is the highest standard possible. We held our on-site assessment in June and received many positive feedback. I was recently told that the Police Department will be recommended to receive the Gold Standard accreditation in November. I'll conclude this report with a vision of where crime has been trending, and that is down. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Let me ask, uh, first of all, congratulations on the credentialing receiving the gold award. We look forward to that presentation. Uh, let me ask other comments or questions of, of the Chief on this item. If not, I recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. Chief, good evening. Are we seeing a trend downward in youth crime, or is it about the same? I wouldn't have any numbers for you, but I, uh, if, if crime's going down in all uh, the areas, I would presume that the youth crime. Mm -hmm. I don't have a breakdown for you in reference to it, though. Could we get it at some point? We can get it for you. We, we should be able to get you the numbers. Okay, thank you. We, we had one person who signed up to uh, speak on this item, Victoria Peterson. You have two minutes. It's Victoria Peterson. I'm sorry. No matter. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, do I get two minutes or three minutes? Two minutes. There is some information in your in your in your report dealing with your youth crime if this report is correct. Um, my concern is that not just so much the youth crime, Mr. Mayor and city council members, is the overall crime in this community, particularly in the African American community. I'm hoping maybe one day with this police chief or maybe if we get one, a new one in the future, that this city will actually be able to also receive the, the part two crimes. The part two crime report is just as important as the part one. Right now, this community over the last several years, since all of our police chiefs have been here, and I have asked uh, the city council uh, numerous times to please also ask for the part two crimes. We have thousands and thousands of crimes being committed in this community. We have a lot of our young men and young women who are involved in criminal activity. And one of the reasons is because they cannot get jobs. And particularly young African American men, I, um, we have a double system in this community. 
I have watched and I have spoken to numerous young African American men that are constantly being harassed in the black community, that are constantly being, being arrested, 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 arrested. When you have a criminal record, it is, it is just about impossible in this community and in this state to get employment. And that's one of the main problems that is going on in this community. Even when a young man is at the age of 18 or 19 or 20 years old, and he goes out and he commits a crime and he gets himself together, at the age of 25, 30, or 40, in this community, he is still held those crimes that he did years ago, he cannot get employment basically in this community. And Mr. Mayor, I talked to a young man who did, who did 14 years in prison. He's trying to get his life together and he cannot get employment in this community. So Durham is going to continue to have a crime problem, a serious crime problem. And tell Mr. Mayor we really address, really address the problem. And the problem is employment amongst young African-American men that cannot get jobs. Thank and you, thank Mr. you Mr. very much. Thank you. We move to the general business agenda public hearings. Item 22, assessments and improvements. Uh, many assessment role for Sewell, Maine on East Cornwallis Road. Good evening, Mayor Bell, <coughs> members of council. I'm Marvin Williams, Director of Public Works for the city. Item 22 before you is to request a delay in the public hearing for the mini assessment roll for the sewer main on East, Co East Cornwallis Road until the October 7th city council meeting. All of the affected property owners have been notified. I indicated this is a public hearing item, so I'm, this is open. You've heard the staff report. Let me ask if anyone who wants to speak on this item. Uh, if not, let the record reflect no one else has to speak. Entertain a motion on item again. So moved, Mr. Mayor. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes six to zero. Uh, item 23, consolidated annexation item, Hendricks South Port. Good evening. I'm Scott Whiteman from the Planning Department. Before, we, before I begin, I would uh, like to certify for the record that all notifications for these items have been provided and affidavits are on file as required by law. This consolidated annex annexation item consists of four separate requests related to the Hendrick South Point development. The applicant is requesting a utility extension agreement to provide city water and sewer service to the site. The departments of public works and water management performed a utility impact analysis and determine that capacity is adequate to serve the proposed development. Case BDG 1202 is a voluntary petition for contiguous annexation submitted by the property owners of this site. The Budget Management Services Department has performed a fiscal impact analysis based on the most intense use permitted within the proposed zoning and has estimated that revenues will exceed estimated expenditures immediately upon annexation. Plan Amendment Case A1214 is a request to change the future land use map for 12.87 acres of the overall site from low medium density residential to commercial. Zoning case Z1225 is a request for initial zoning of the entire site for commercial general with a development plan. The proposed zoning would allow up to 180,000 square feet of commercial development. In addition to the commitments proffered by the applicant and listed in your staff report, Several new commitments were provided to the planning department today, which I will read into the record. One, no loudspeakers will be used on the campus. Two, outdoor lighting will be down lighting with sag lenses. Lenses will not protrude lower than the lighting fixtures. House shields will be utilized in fixtures within 50 feet of residential uses. Three, no tractor trailer truck deliveries will occur between the hours of eight o'clock p.m and 6 o'clock a.m. Four, accessory buildings will not exceed two stories in height. Five, an 18-inch stone wall will be erected along the eastern boundary line on Fayetteville Road from the southern property line north to the 20-foot buffer at Chaparral Drive. Six, a payment will be made to the city's sidewalk fund 
at the city's established rate of the funds necessary to extend the sidewalk along Fayetteville Road from the southern property line to the intersection of Massey Chapel Road. And seven, the buffer along the southern property line from the stream buffer to Fayetteville Road shall be 75 feet in width. The staff recommends that the council approve the extension agreement, voluntary annexation, plan amendment, and initial zoning. The planning commission recommended of approval of both the plan amendment and zoning change by a vote of 10 to two. I'd be happy to answer any questions from the council. Uh, th this is a public hearing, and I, I guess for me procedurally, I, I guess I want to make sure I'm clear on what we're doing this evening and how we're going to do it. Uh, it seems to me the first order of business would be to deal with the annexation piece, uh, because uh, once that's done, then then I think it would be appropriate to try to deal with the zoning, the extension, et cetera. So uh, unless I rule out order, Mr. Mr. Attorney, I'd like us to consider that. I, I don't believe that there is an, an issue, Mr. Medlin, standing. No, no issue, OK. Well, in, in that case, I, I, I would like us to deal with the annexation piece first. So if the planning director would uh, come forth and speak to that. Steve, you want to come forth and speak to the annexation what's being requested? And l l let me tell you why, why I want that. I mean, we, we all know this project has been on the books for a long time trying, trying to move it forward. And I guess we're going to get some of these questions answered as to what's being proposed and how much is being considered. But I, I want to make sure that the persons whose property was going to be a part of this initial project that's being proposed understand the implications of annexation and the process that we've got to go through to make that happen. I mean, once, this, once you're annexed, then you're part of the city. And as a result, you know, city taxes and all those other things come forth, along with public services and all other things. But I just want to make sure we're clear on that annexation piece. And I want to make sure that every person whose property is being proposed as a part of this has submitted a voluntary annexation petition. Because annexation laws have changed now uh, we no longer can do involuntary annexation uh, as we have done it. So it's important that uh, we have on the record those persons who have said, I want to be voluntarily annexed into this area because I don't want anyone to come back late and say I wasn't part of the petition or nobody. And I know you've got it there, but just for the record, I'd like to go through that. Yes, Mr. Mayor, uh, at the time the petition was submitted, the city clerk did certify that all the signatures were received. And today we double check based on the current tax records and all the same owners are still the owners of record and all signatures have been received from those owners. So if that being the case, uh, can we just reference that for the record, uh, those petitions that is part of one of our attachments? Mr. Mayor, that is part of the attachment to the staff report as attachment 17 includes all of the signatures. I think it goes beyond. I think we also have 18, 19 attachments and 20, I think. No, 19, yeah, 20. So if, if that's the case, can, can you just reference those and then I entertain a motion on the annexation piece? It's, so the signatures are only in attachment 17. There are several other attachments uh, after attachment 17 one of which is the annexation ordinance, which you would be approving if you approve the annexation. Right. So do I, I, I get a motion to entertain a motion to adopt Mr. the annexation? I'll move to adopt the annexation resolution. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Are, are there any other persons that want to speak on this item, this being an annexation piece? And again, this is a public hearing, so I want to make sure everybody's clear on that. Does anyone want to speak on this item? If not, let the record reflect no one asked to speak. I would declare the public hearing to be closed and would then entertain a motion to annex those properties as indicated. Uh, it's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes six to zero. Okay, let's uh, come back to you. Planning director for the next items. Was that annexation? That, that the annexation was effective September the 30th. That's a part of the. That's correct. Okay.
So, Mr. Mayor, it's the Council's pleasure. Uh, at this time, you can either take up the utility extension agreement or the comprehensive plan amendment. Well, let, let, let me su suggest something again. Uh, I think it'd probably be more appropriate to deal with the zoning piece and then talk about the extension of water and sewer. We don't want to extend water and sewer into this area unless we know specifically what we're going to be doing. So then uh, I believe the best order would be to consider the plan amendment, which would right. require a public hearing, and then after that, the council can consider the zoning map change and then Thank the you. utility extension agreement. Right. Is the staff going to present any more on the proposed change? So my initial presentation included uh, all of those items. Um, if you have any questions about any of those, I'd be happy to answer them. The plan amendment is case A1214 and is a request for only 12.87 acres of the overall site from low medium density residential to commercial. All right, you've heard the staff recommendation. Are there questions or comments by, by the staff on this item? Again, this is a public hearing item. I would ask are there any questions or comments on this particular item? Recognize Attorney Lewis Cheek. Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor, Pro Tem, and members of the City Council, my name is Lewis Cheek. I represent the developers of Hendrick South Point. We're here to support a plan amendment for 12.87 acres and a zoning map change for 33.373 acres of property in the Kennington Heights area. We ask you to amend the future land use map of the comprehensive plan to change the designation of the 12.87 acres from low medium density residential to commercial. There are a number of reasons to support the change. The commercial designation is in character with the way surrounding property has developed and is developing. Kennington Heights has been indicated as a future commercial node since 2002 and this is a natural extension of the node to additional frontage on Fayetteville Road. The requirements for stream buffering, storm management, and road widening make this parcel economically infeasible for low medium residential development. Stream buffering creates two oddly shaped building areas which physically restrict low medium density residential development. There's no water and sewer to the property the stream buffers provide a natural boundary between this commercial and the residential to the south. The amendment is consistent with comprehensive plan policies and with future land use patterns. There is sufficient infrastructure for development of this property as commercial. Designating this property as commercial will not adversely impact necessary dwelling units in the city of Durham. The site is of adequate shape and size to accommodate the use. The planning department has thoroughly reviewed the request and recommends approval, and the planning commission heard the case and voted 10 to 2 to recommend approval, and we would ask that you uh, vote to uh, amend the plan. Thank you. Again, as a public hearing, you've heard the uh, proponent's recommendation. I would ask other persons that want to speak on this item. Uh, first, are there any comments from members of the council on this item? Hearing or not, I do have a person that has signed up to speak on this item as an opponent. And it's item 23, consolidated annexation item, Hendrick South Point. Um, Ms. Helen Ellison, is she present? Would you like to speak now? If you come forth to the podium, please, to the right. Is, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item uh, in opposition or I have persons that have signed up to speak as proponents? So I'm going to call the proponents whose names are signed up, uh, Mooney, Mujahid, Jeanette Wilson, Anita Keith Faust, and that's it. So Ms. Ellison, this, you can come up to this podium here, please. You have, you have five minutes. Okay. Uh, I, my name is Helen Ellison, and I own property at 7219 Fayetteville Road, 7227 Fayetteville Road, and 7610 Massey Chapel Road. 
This, this property is basically right across from uh, Massey Chapel Church and where the, uh, the dealership will, uh, John Property lies with the, uh, the Massey Chapel Church and I am right across on the corner of Massey Chapel Road and Fedville Road. And I am concerned about uh, basically, uh, well, it's not the buffer. I can deal with that. But when it comes to um, widening uh, the road to make that left-hand turn off Massive Chapel, off, off Fedville onto Massive Chapel, uh, from what I understand, it will be um, a complete, uh, it will basically consist of uh, a, a left-hand turn, which would be uh, equivalent to uh, uh, the space of, um, the sp it would be equivalent to uh, uh, left-hand turn lane is what it is, basically. And I am concerned, I'm not, basically, I, I don't know how much property it would take, but I own approximately uh, about a thousand feet uh, on Massive Chapel onto um, Fedville, that left, where that left-hand turn would be. And I am concerned, uh, whether or not I would be compensated for the property. Um, I had, uh, basically, I think I had heard something like 15 feet, it would take about 15 feet, and that would be uh, maybe a uh, uh, hundred, I mean a thousand feet times, I don't know if it would be 15 feet, but I, do know that when they widen the roads and make left-hand turn, I mean, turn lanes, that it can consist of a bit of property because we had, my family had given a bit of property before when Massive Chapel was straightened. They had attempted to take straighten the road and we had given quite a bit of land. So I definitely am concerned about how much land would be, if it is 15 feet, that would be almost half of my, uh, the front, the, uh, my front yard on Massey Chapel. So I am concerned uh, whether or not I would be compensated or what would actually happen. And it seems that this left-hand turn line will only be on what the, the land would come from only one side of the road and not both sides, which mean, you know, on my side of the road, I would be uh, losing quite a bit of land. And so I am definitely concerned about that. Elson, it might help. Um, I know we have other proponents that want to speak, but maybe Mike, I'm not going to talk about the compensation, but uh -huh. it might be good if you could show the uh, aerial map, or either drawing Lewis. I'm, I'm looking at it on my attachment three, and our diagram. Someone can put a picture up of the location of Massey Chapel Road and Fayetteville Road relative to the site that we're looking at. Yes, it would be the corner, uh, the lot 7219-7227 on Fayetteville Road. Can someone from the staff, Steve? Can someone from the staff uh, put this diagram up on? Which 
Scott, could you show the property you're talking about? The, or the traffic on our bill or somebody? Did you, did you? Can someone from staff please address the issue about whether this lady's property will be impacted by the turn lane? Yes, Bill Judge with transportation. Uh, as part of the zoning, uh, there is a requirement of 751 South has previously proffered to widen Massey Chapel to provide two westbound lanes. Um, this developer has also included that proffer as may be required. Um, so if, if that improvement is required as part of the site plan, then the developer would be responsible for acquiring any unit right away and compensating the property owner accordingly. So when will we know that? Well, depends on the timing. Right now, the developer has already submitted a TIA phasing analysis with the site plan. If they go forward with the site plan at this time, it's unlikely that this improvement would be required. It's mainly due to the traffic from 751 South if they were to not move forward with the site plan at this time. And so if 751 South were to move forward before this development, then it could be required. Thank you. Councilwoman Katari and Councilwoman Moffitt. Thank you, Mayor. On the development plan, it shows a dark dotted line and then it goes into a lighter one. Do you have any sense of um, what the length of that turn lane would be? How far back from the Fayetteville Road intersection on Massey Chapel it would go? Um, I don't remember the exact storage, but typically it's about 150 to 200 feet of full length storage and then taper beyond that. So it would, would not be for the entire frontage. And then um, whether or not it was all to this property owner side versus the other property owner, the applicant would just, or whoever moves forward, would need to look at the availability of right away and the constructability, to make that determination. Can someone address how um, right away purchases the uh, property value is determined? That would be a negotiation between whoever's trying to acquire the property and the property owner. The question is, it's one thing to negotiate. Do you have to have a willing buyer, a willing seller? Can the property owner say, I don't want to sell my property for that? Right. I mean, I guess that's what right. we're trying to get, get an understanding of. Right. Correct. If they were unable to reach an agreement, then um, the private developer does not have the ability to do any sort of condemnation. They would have to go to either the state or the city council to, to ask for their assistance, but um, that would be at council's discretion or, or the state's discretion as to whether or not they would even assist and at full cost of the developer if they were unable to come to an agreement between the two parties. So recognize Council Moffitt. Just to be clear, when you say they could go to the state or the city council for their assistance, what you mean is to the use of eminent domain to, um, and so let's just be really, let's just put it on the table so we know what we're talking about. Right. Yes, correct. I mean, uh, an eminent domain for, for a condemnation to, to acquire any right of way or easements, but and that would be up to those bodies, either the state or, or the council to, to agree to participate. It's I'm not even sure that's correct, actually. Uh, I have to defer to the city attorney, but I thought the law was changed that prohibited uh, eminent domain from the city council for private that's development. Is it? That, that's, that's my understanding. I'm, I'm just not sure about the nuances of this particular um, situation, but, but yeah, you're right. It, it, you, you can't take the property oh. of a private owner for, a, um, for another private entity. So the road widening wouldn't be considered public purpose? Oh, okay, so then let's switch over to the planning department for a minute. So if we have an unwilling seller and a committed element, what then happens? Sorry, I'm shorter than Mr. Judge. Um, Steve Madeline with the Durham City County Planning Department. Obviously, if it becomes a committed element on the face of the development plan and the developer is unable to execute that committed element, then they cannot go forward with their project. You, you have a question? 
Councilman Shul, did you have a question? Yeah. Okay. So um, let me see if I understand this. It, it, also, can I make one request, which is, could we s m turn this document around so that we get n a, 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 a north-south orientation? Thank you. Um, Yeah, Just for you. Ms. Ellison, could you point specifically to the diagram where your property is so we all know uh, I'm, where we're on? Okay. Where he is, right? Yeah. Where he is, he's right okay. Okay. All right. The corner of Fayetteville and I know where it is, but I just want to make sure. Okay. All right. All right, Councilman Shul. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I probably don't have this right, and so I want to see if I can understand it. Um, so it, it, it's my understanding that uh, Mr. Judge estimates it, it might be a 150-foot storage uh, area, typically, uh, down Massey Chapel Road, uh, that the, that the uh, committed element in this project would uh, would only what I guess yeah so let me ask it this way at what point does this project have to uh, do this work as opposed to the 751 development explain to me the, the interaction of those two and 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 am I right what you said about about 150 foot storage uh. Yes, I had an opportunity to go back, look at the study, and uh, determine the exact distance. It's actually 100 feet, 100 feet of storage, so it's even a little bit less than I had originally estimated. But um, this, this developer would only be required to make this improvement if they fail to submit a site plan or move forward with a site plan prior to 751 South um, submitting a site plan for their development, in which case we'd have to look at the impact of both projects. And at that point, it would be required. But it's also required of the 751 South development. So it's very possible they would end up making an improvement as well. Or but this, just to see if I get it again, this, this project would not have to make that improvement if they submitted their site plan first? Correct, which they have already done. Right. So as long as they move forward with completing okay. that site plan, um, then they would not be required to make this improvement. And I guess at some point I would ask the developers if they're planning to make that improvement, but my guess is they're probably waiting for 751 to make it. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, but but then, then that leads me to, to try to, again, to understand. So I'm just trying to think about Ms. Allison's situation here. That would mean then the developer, uh, these developers would be not, probably not, we'll hear from them, making this improvement. Uh, and therefore there would be no frontage taken from Mrs. Ellison's property, and therefore she would not be in any negotiation with these developers? Is that, am I understand that, if they're planning not to make this improvement? That would be my expectation. The developer would have to probably answer that question, but um, I see no reason if they move forward with the site plan that they currently have in process that they would need to make this improvement or be required to make this improvement. Um, so maybe at some point, Mr. Mayor, we could hear from the developer on, on whether or not what their plan is there. And I guess the only other thing that uh, Ms. Katati said to me, uh, half jokingly, but we do have the situation that the state legislature is involved in the in the other project, and I, I think we might fairly say that uh, it, it's entirely possible that that improvement could be uh, legislatively mandated as as part of our. Uh, as part of the uh, 751 project, uh, it doesn't seem out of the realm of the possible. Okay, thank you. Ms. Ellison, do you understand? <laughs> the, the, the net of the, you, you asking the question, I thought your concern was that your property might be taken to widen Massa Chapel Road. And what we're saying, it depends on which development submits its plan first, whether this developer does it or whether 751 does it. In any event, in uh -huh. any event, it would have to be a negotiated settlement between you 
and the, pro the developer that wants to use the property as to whether or not you all can come up with an agreement on, on the price of your land. That's right. the bottom line to it. And okay. it looks like that based on the traffic impact study, it looks like it's 100 foot of Massey Chapel Road that will be required. As I understood, that, that was the storage area, about 100 feet. Yes, it's 100 feet in length extending back from the Fayetteville Road intersection yes. for the full width. So from the cor corner of Fayetteville Road and Massey Chapel, it would, you, it would go back 100 feet for widening that would be required. Only and then I, I thought you said it would depend on which side of the road of Massey Chapel they chose. Now, is, no. is that? Correct. There's no requirement that it all be on her property. No. There may be construction reasons why it's more advantageous to widen to one side or the other. I haven't looked at it in that detail. The applicant would have to indicate I, whether they have. Okay. I had been informed that it would only come from my side of the road, which would be the north side of Massey Chapel. May, may I, guess I ask who informed you of that? Uh, I believe it was one of the uh, representatives from all right, the well, dealership. The, all right, well, the developer will speak yeah. to that when we get to uh, that point. Okay. But are you clear on where we are now? Yes, pretty okay. much so. All right, thank and you. And I appreciate your Th help. Thank you. Uh, now we have, we have that's, that's all right now, thank you. Uh, we have three people that have asked to speak again on this item in support of it, and I don't know if you want to speak now or you want to let the developers move forward. I'll call your names again. Jeanette Wilson, uh, Anita Keith Faust, and Mona Mijahad. Mijahadi. Do you all want to speak now? You do want to speak now? Oh, no, we don't, we don't yield time. You, all right. Do you want, does any, any, any of the two people that are left want to speak at this time? Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Jeanette Wilson and my address is 222 Kentington Road. I'm here this evening to represent the homeowners who live in Kentington Heights and we are in support of this project, the Hendricks at South Point. We also wanted to give you a perspective of those of us, from those of us who actually live in Kentington. At one time, Kentington Heights consisted of approximately 32 plus homes. However, presently we are down to less than 15 occupied homes. The major reason for this mass exodus out of Kennington is because of the water and sewer problems. The land does not perk and therefore does not sustain a well and septic system. Those vacant homes are left abandoned and uh, they're dilapidated, which has caused increased crime in our community. There are property owners with multiple wells on their sites. Some property owners have even resorted to using water holding tanks just to ensure an adequate water supply. One homeowner is paying a mortgage in Kennington Heights, but he's paying rent someplace else because his septic system failed. At one time, he was having his septic system cleaned on a weekly basis, and that was a financial hardship for him and his family, and he had to abandon his home. We have residents, senior citizens who are in their 70s who have never been able to wash clothing in their own homes. We have residents who have become ill and could not be discharged back to their own homes because of the living conditions. The water is often discolored, undrinkable, and unusable for food preparation. We must buy drinking water for, and cooking water. Kennington Heights is a large parcel of land, however, nearly two-thirds of it is undeveloped. The landowners who own property out there are unable to sell or develop their land because the land simply does not perk. In 2002, the city of Durham was developing a comprehensive long-range land use plan, and at that time, my neighbors and I stood here and asked that the property in Kennington receive a future land use designation for commercial development, and it was granted. We have patiently waited for over 11 years for this night to come, and it has finally arrived. Council members, this is an opportunity to finish what was started in 2002 by approving and putting this commercial development on the land that was pre previously designated for it. It is also an opportunity to rid Southern Durham of a 40-year-old rundown and dilapidated community. In conclusion, the homeowners in Kennington Heights have signed a statement that we wanted to share with you this evening, and it reads, we the below signed homeowner occupants in Kennington Heights are presenting this letter in support of the Hendricks at South Point Auto Park development. We are also publicly stating our satisfaction with any and all arrangements with this developer. And it is signed Antoinette Howes, Ida Kolak, Larry and Deborah Swinton, Willie and Irene Bigelow, Baby Ruth Nicholson, Avon Lassiter Sr., Angela Smith, Shirley Walker, Christine Taft, Theodore Nicholson, Magnolia McMillan, and myself, Jeanette Wilson. 
Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I don't know whether it's appropriate now for me to speak to Ms. Ellison's issue. I, I think it, we ought to do it during the zoning map change. I, right I right now we're that. on the plan amendment, and I'm trying to find out if anybody else wants to speak on the plan amendment that's being proposed. Uh, we had a motion and a second to approve the plan amendment, have we? Has, no one has done that? Not yet, but okay. I will do it. Uh, I'm going to close the public hearing on this item first. Does anybody else want to speak on this, the plan amendment? Uh, if not, let the record reflect no one else has to speak on the plan amendment. Uh, that item is now back before the council. Move the item. Second. second. It's been properly moved and second uh, to change the future land use map designation of comprehensive plan from low medium density to commercial. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes six to zero. Okay, now we can move to the zoning. I'm Scott Whiteman from the Planning Department. Uh, the next case related to the Hendrick South Point development is the zoning change, which is case Z1225, which would establish commercial general with a development plan zoning as the initial zoning of this site. The current county zoning is rural residential. This proposed zoning would allow up to 180,000 square feet of commercial development and includes all the committed elements that were pre presented in your staff report as well that, as I read on the record earlier. The staff recommends approval, as did the Planning Commission at their August meeting by a vote of 10 to 2. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Are there questions of the staff report? Re recognize Councilwoman. Okay. In that case, we'll hear from the proponents. Uh, we also request, um, Mr. Mayor and members of Council, that you zone the entire 33.373 acre tract commercial general with a development plan. Uh, in asking for this, we are bringing you precisely what was envisioned for Kennington Heights in the 2005 Comprehensive Plan, a development through single ownership or as a single project employing unifying design elements, roadways, and buffers. Kennington Heights was recognized as a neighborhood in transition and was designated as a special redevelopment area. This recognized that the character of the area had experienced a substantial change over time and that a commercial use had become the appropriate use. The property went from agriculture and very low residential to suburban scale subdivisions surrounding a regional mall. Cannington Heights was designated commercial under the com com comprehensive plan, but without water and sewer was left to wait for the developer to come along who had the vision and the economic ability to bring folks what they wanted. They've waited a long time. Opportunities like this don't happen often. Hendrick South Point asked for commercial zoning. The idea is to bring an automobile park to this track and other contiguous property. Not strip development, but an orderly configuration of automobile dealerships on their own campus, similar to the Cary Auto Mall. With that come employees, sales, sales tax, property tax, and economic impact. Hendrick South Point believes that this is the prime location and that it fits their needs perfectly. They haven't seen another location which is large enough and brings all of the characteristics they are seeking. This is a city-initiated zoning request. The planning department has fully studied it. Staff finds that it's consistent with the requirements of the UDO and that with the plan amendment, this request is consistent with a comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. The planning commission recommended approval by a vote of 10 to 2. This is the and maybe the only opportunity for Kennington Heights to get the commercial user it has sought and fought for over all of these years. It's an opportunity for Durham to realize a substantial increase in tax base and to see beneficial use made of property which has sat mostly vacant for many years. Please vote to zone the property commercial general with a development plan and I'd ask that the folks supporting this please stand. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, with respect to Ms. Ellison's issue, we're moving full speed ahead uh, on the site plan. We have submitted two site plans, actually, uh, and are proceeding as quickly as we can to get those in place. Um, and we anticipate that the 751 project will be the project that is called upon to do whatever needs to be done with respect to Massey Chapel Road uh, and the uh, 
uh, improvements that we've talked about. Could you uh, speak to Ms. Ellison's point that she was informed that the enlargement would take place on her side of the road, and I thought you were getting ready to step. Could you speak to that? Did somebody speak to that? Our side, our side. My name is Stacy Woodhouse with WRS uh, 550 Long Point Load Road, uh, Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. Um, in, in an effort to be completely upfront with Ms. Ellison, at the, at the beginning of this project, we thought that uh, it might be a possibility that we would need to make the improvement. And so we notified Ms. Ellison of that, and I've had several meetings uh, in Ms. Ellison's home with her to discuss that and informed her that she would be compensated for uh, such take you know, road uh, improvements if we had to make them. Um, when we did the analysis, uh, we determined that the amount of uh, road and um, right of way that needed to be taken was much less on the northern side than on the southern side of the road, and that's why the northern side was chosen because it required much less property. It was, it was no other decision than that. It just had less impact on property owners. Um, uh, and as we move forward, we did a phasing plan, which then uh, showed that since we've submitted the other site, pl the site plan, uh, we will not be required to make this improvement. Um, and as Mr. Cheek said, this will most likely be required of the 751 project if it moves forward. So, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, Ms. Ellison, understood? Is she still around? Okay, you understood that. All right, thank you. Recognize Councilwoman Katari. Did you have a comment, question? Okay. Uh, Anita Keith Faust. Well, let me ask this. Anyone else want to speak on this item that hasn't signed up? Okay, let the record reflect. No one else has to speak either for or against. I'm going to turn it back to the council. Recognize Councilwoman Katari. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I had two questions. Uh, one regarding the last proffered committed element, uh, item seven, the buffer along the southern property line from the stream buffer to Fayetteville Road would be 75 feet in width. And um, staff had uh, emailed an illustration of that. And I don't know if you have a copy that you could show for people. I wanted to visually have a sense of how wide that was for how it pertained to surrounding properties. So, Mr. Medlin, if you could point out the stream buffer and the width and then the additional width and talk about opacity as well, if possible. Sure. Sorry. Um, Steve Medlin with the Durham Planning Department. Uh, if you bear with me just one second, I'll see if I can't blow this up so you can actually see it a little bit better. To put this in uh, perspective here, this is the southern property line that you see here, uh, which uh, the Massey Chapel Church is the property owner to the south. Uh, across the street uh, is James Ross Road and Massey Chapel Road here. Uh, there is a 100-foot stream buffer from top of bank on each side that basically runs from this point down to the south. Uh, the uh, committed element that the applicant has um, made this evening is to add an additional 25 feet of buffer area to the southern buffer that had originally been proposed of 50 feet. Uh, so if you're looking at this graphic, the green is the additional 25 feet, and I apologize, it may not be quite to scale. I tried to throw this together very quickly this evening. Uh, with the uh, mustard color, orange color to the south being the original 50-foot buffer that had been shown on the, on the development plan of record. Uh, obviously within that 75-foot area, the only thing that potentially could happen would be the uh, installation of landscape materials that are required by ordinance. There would be no other activities that would be permissible uh, in that area. Mr. Medlin, do you have the subsequent, I mean you had two um, illustrations, thank you, if you could just go down there. Um, I, I did this one, uh, this is not part of the development plan, I want to be very clear, this is actually part of the site plan package that has been submitted, uh, but I did want to quickly reference what the potential impact would be to the current design. What you see here is the configuration of the display um, portion of the dealership uh, with the additional 25 feet of uh, buffer. It will have a slight impact on the display area that you see in this general area here. 
which means the site plan will need to be ultimately redesigned to, uh, to move those parking spaces out and possibly reconfigure the drive aisles if necessary. Um, my second question is really t for the applicant, which um, this rezoning really looks at it will phase one is just a portion of the entire Kennington Heights area. Could you comment on your intent on phase two? I'm particularly concerned about the homeowners that are in the back half of Kennington Heights. We, we have every intention of closing on phase one and phase two uh, following the meeting tonight, if we're successful. <laughs> um, and uh, so that uh, it would take into consideration both of those phases. Uh, phase two is, in fact, a phase two. Uh, it will be a continuation of uh, our plans for phase one. Can you just clarify what exactly that means in terms of the um, homeowners in phase two and the in, uh, intended sale or purchase of their property? If you could just. We'll be, we'll be purchasing those properties following this meeting. Dan, uh, I, I had asked, I had asked uh, the developers to provide a list of all of the contracts or options that they had. I, I didn't see that, but you say on the public record you have options for all the remaining property. Uh, for the record, can I just hear that? Yes, we do. Okay. And I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, we made copies of all of those contracts. If they didn't get to you, that's they my fault. They, they didn't get to me. And you had, a, you had a couple of sites on there that said property was owned by South Point Mall. Now, how, how do you deal with that? that that's Stacy Woodhouse with WRS. Um, We've approached South Point Mall about purchasing the five parcels which they own in, inside Kennington Heights and giving them the opportunity to, opportunity to uh, sell. Um, we are currently in discussions with them. We haven't currently worked out a, um, a, a purchase price and, and deal with uh, South Point Mall, um, but we are moving forward and we are, pur just to clarify, we are purchasing all the residents' houses um, together um, after we have a successful vote tonight, and uh, we will move forward regardless whether South Point Mall sells us their parcels or not. So at some point in time, I assume that means that you'll come back to the city to annex that section of those properties now? Yes, sir. Okay. Recognize Councilwoman Pitani. Yeah, just a clarification, you mentioned purchasing all the residents' homes, but if it, there's no uh, house on the property, you're planning on purchasing Yes, ma'am. All the properties, whether they have a house on them or not. Thank you. M yes. Ask the Mayor Pro Tem. I was actually ready to, to make a motion, um, but you need to close, I guess you this is this fine, this fine. whole thing is a matter of environmental justice for me and and i spoke with uh, attorney cheek earlier and um, as a woman of faith i'm stepping out on faith that you all are going to do the right thing for all of them and and i'm holding uh attorney cheek accountable um, as i stand if you like that's fine with me, Madam Pro Mayor Pro Tem. I don't have a problem with that. Right. Is that a part of the public record? Yeah, yeah this is on the record. <laughs> I recognize Councilman Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do have <clears throat> one clarification that I would like to make, and I think I'm correct on this. And I've been here for 10 years. I think uh, you were very eloquent tonight when you addressed us, but uh, you did state that your neighborhood has been waiting, I think, 11 years for this, and I hope you didn't mean the implication that it was the city council that had, had delayed <laughs> any, because I, I recall hearing from some of you in the past about 
certain people who would not negotiate with other developers, and they were holding up the development from going forth. And I just want to go on the record for that. Is that am I correct on that? I, we didn't hear you. Come to the mic. <laughs> Um, calculations of 11 years was based on the 2002 decision when we were granted approval for the land to be developed for commercial uh, for commercial development. That's my 11 years. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Shul. Is that correct? I have a question for the uh, developer. Uh, if I was to drive down uh, Fayetteville Road what would it look like to me driving down Fatville Road? Or if I was Ms. Ellison and I was looking across from her property, what would I see? Uh, well, what you would see, and I'm assuming you mean after we finish this after development. After you finish the development. Um, what if you, you should happen to get the support of the council, Mr. Chief. What, what you would see would be uh, trees along the roadway, uh, a stone wall uh, 18 inches high, uh, and there would be some parking for automobiles along there. Would the um, would the would the um, st would the stone wall be uh, would would it be visible or would it be would it be covered by plantings or you know what what is the what's the landscaping going to look like? Uh, my belief is it would be visible. Um, mm -hmm. However, we can we can fix that. However, it might yeah. suit the council. And the visibility of the cars would be you know would, would that be what you would mostly see? I don't know that it'd be what you'd mostly see. I think you'd see the, the trees and the, um, and the landscaping and the stone wall, yeah. more so than the cars. But, okay. but obviously, I mean, we're talking about automobile dealerships, and, yeah. and they want to have some visibility from the sure. roadway. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not going to try to kid anybody about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and the... Um, I guess my only uh, my only other question involves the the buffer along the southern property line. Uh, could you talk about how this compares to what was in the uh, request from the the DOST committee during the open DOS space and trails? The the DOST committee asked for a some greater buffer than that. Um, we have really invested greatly economically in this property uh, and we need the use of it um, and we believe that the stream buffer creates a very substantial buffer uh, and that the additional buffer creates a buffer for the church okay all right thank you mr mayor all right are there other questions comments by members of the council if not i'm going to declare the public meeting to be closed the matter is back before the council it's been properly moved and second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes six to zero. Thank you. That, go, you want to discuss item nine now? No, I think we, no, item, I I'm sorry, okay. I, wait, hold on, wait a minute. There's Staff has some questions. There's still a, uh, still a fence agreement for Hendrick South Point that the council okay. needs to consider. You're right. Consider. Also, also. No. I moved the uh, extension agreement. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Yeah. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passed the six to zero. Okay, that, that concludes item 23, consolidated annexation item, Hendrick South Point. We have <laughs> one more item. No. <laughs> I Mr. Mayor, just just a minute. There was an item also associated with park. With that's what the city manager yeah, was just asking yeah, about. Yes, enough. That wasn't voted on either. I entertain a motion on that item. Okay. Park that item D to Parkwood, please. Okay. Mr. Mayor, I move that item, please. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, we open the vote. Close the vote. It Check. passes six to zero. Six to zero, okay. Passes six to zero. Let me tell you about item nine, Mr. Mayor. 
Kevin, tell Kevin not to leave. Uh, we need to clear the room. We need to clear the room. Now tell them. <laughs> we got this. I do. That's why I want them to clear this room. Hey, Kevin. Come, come on up. Kevin, yes, sir. Yeah. I, the item was pulled, and I'm not sure what the questions were, and I, I can't hear. Kevin Dick with the Office of Economic and Workforce Development. What introduced the item? Item 9, um, this was uh, the proposed contract extension uh, with General Management Solutions Incorporated in the amount of $495,000 from October 1, 2013 through March 31st, 2014. Kevin, I, I noted that um, this company was able to find jobs for X number of people. What I'd like to know is whether or not those jobs paid a living wage. Secondly, uh, do you anticipate at some point in the future that there will be another extension of this firm? If so, I would like to see somebody in at least North Carolina given an opportunity to do this work. They have held this contract uh, for a long time. So is this the end of their contract, the end of this particular service? And how can we get somebody in North Carolina? I know we have some minority firms who, somebody in North Carolina who can do this work. Thank you. Yeah, and did you submit the report to us because I couldn't find it. Yes, sir. The, the report should be on your iPad. It was submitted at the end of last week. Okay. All right. Could you just brief one minute summary of, of what you found in terms of the question that we had asked? Sure. The cost per job uh, and the fact the longevity of those employed. I'd be happy to. Uh, Can to you speak up? I'd be happy to. To answer um, Madam Mayor Pro Tem's first question, the, the uh, wage range that uh, uh, for which people have found jobs generally has uh, ranged from $26,000 per year to uh, approximately $70,000 per year. So to answer that question, um, that average wage range would yield that the jobs have generally been uh, above livable wage. The second question you asked was about whether this is, um, this would be the last extension of their contract. This will be the last extension of their, under, of their contract under the request proposals um, for which they were chosen. They were chosen in 2010 in a competitive RFP process no Durham businesses uh, competed against them, except the Office, of the Office of Economic and Workforce Development was the only Durham entity that competed against them. Um, an RFP committee consisting of volunteers from the Durham Workforce Development Board um, chose G General Management Solutions, Inc. over the other entities that bid. There were no other, in fact, there were no other North Carolina firms that bid. So, th so, um, there would not have been an opportunity for a Durham business um, to get this contract. I, w I do want to mention that one of the reasons that they were um, rec advised by the RFP committee um, and, well, excuse me, recommended by the RFP committee, which ultimately advised staff to recommend them to the city council, and the city council um, did approve the 
recommendation unanimously. And one of the reasons that the advice and the recommendation were made is because this firm has uh, consistently uh, helped the region meet or exceed its performance measures, and it's done so in a way that is consistent with WIA rules and regulations. That means we pass our monitorings and we pass our audits. The stat we have staff that provide technical assistance to contractors and can provide technical assistance to community organizations. And the main way we do that is by helping direct them to the um, Workforce Investment Act rules and regulations that is on the, D the uh, Department of Labor Employment and Training website. So if other Durham businesses and, and or North Carolina businesses understand Workforce Investment Act rules and regulations and demonstrate an experience in helping, um, in helping to find people jobs uh, at livable wages and help them retain jobs, which are the, the uh, common measures of the federal guidelines, then they would have an opportunity to uh, beat out a firm like GMSI. The, the fact is that in the competitive RFPs that um, have taken place, um, including the one in 2010, for which the current contract is under, um, GMSI was found to be, to be the best firm that did that. There is, current, there is an RFP that is currently out. Um, other firms have the opportunity to bid. We actually had, had a bidder's conference uh, in our office last week, and other firms had the opportunity, uh, opportunity to compete. How do you advertise? It's advertised, it was advertised in the Durham Herald Sun, um, in the News and Observer, um, I believe in three other um, periodicals, including the Triangle Tribune, Carolina Times, and uh, Latino Publications, also advertised in the city website. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd like a copy of all those entities to make sure that they're getting to all the publications that you've indicated still. I think that we need to do everything in our power to uh, improve the, the economy of our state, of, of the city of Durham, and everything we can to use our own contractors. That's, and you don't have to respond to that. That's just my belief. Thank you very much. The other questions uh, that were posed last week uh, related to the number of clients that have been served and the number that have been placed. The number of clients um, that have been served during this three-year period um, is approximately 1,300. Um, of those, 413 have exited the program. That means they have basically um, gotten services for a period of time, and then those services have been terminated. Of that 413, 331 were granted employment, and a substantial percentage of those, approximately 75 to 80%, retain those positions for at least six months, and as I said earlier, uh, at wages that exceeded the Durham Livable Wage Standard. Okay, I don't want to belabor this, and I'm sorry, I, I just couldn't find your report, and I sh should have asked the manager about it, but uh, the cost per job came out to what? Because we have spent $3 million since 2010. No, sir, we have not spent $3 million no. since 2010. No. 495000 is being recommended this evening. No, I'm not talking that about that. I'm talking about going back, okay. you know, since 2010. Sure. And I thought this, including the additional half a million, round numbers, would be at close to $3 million. That's correct. Right. We have not spent $3 million since 2010. That's what I was responding to. We've spent 2.6 million, and we're okay. recommending 495,000. Um, the cost per the, the the cost per um, would amount to, uh, based on those employed, it would be it would amount to eight to nine thousand dollars per participant, which includes costs related to the training they get, um, on the job training uh, salaries that would be paid to employers, and supportive services that may be paid on behalf of clients as well as emergency assistance costs for clients. So the, 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 a substantial percentage of the monies that go to this contractor are to administer services that go directly to clients. They're not, $3.1 million is not retained by the contractor. The monies are, are essentially passed through to client services. I understand. <laughs> okay. All right. Here's my only point, uh, Kevin, that perhaps in the future when you submit a report like this, 
not the secondary report, uh, but the first one that you include uh, statistics on, and information that are just very basic questions that any of us, I think, would ask. You know, how to. many people uh, have been serviced? How long have they been employed? And what was the aggregate cost for those receiving a job? That's all. Be Thank you. To. You're welcome. No, well, what about the item? I'm going to approve. Well, we can approve. I move um, reluctantly, but we approve the item. <laughs> it's been properly moved and seconded. Further questions? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? It passes six to zero. Okay. Any other items to come before the council at this time? If not, the meeting's adjourned at 8.57 p.m. Thank you.